So perhaps this is an emotional Sunday. As we come to a transitional point in a two and a half year relationship, two years of which the most intense, with our beloved book of Romans. And, and here we, we come to this place of, of transition. Uh, and, and of course, we remember every single week of the two years within the two and a half years that we've been here, right? That just goes without saying. Of course, uh, somewhat in, in jest, a transitional time, but it strikes me as, as we often study the Scripture we tend to give attention to the, maybe the primary, what we decipher to be the primary teaching moments, the primary applicational moments, and we, we draw attention there, the light shines there, and some of the others we, we place maybe more on the periphery as, as less important. But, but let's remember, if all Scripture is inspired by God, If all scripture is the very breath of God, the very revelation of God, the very word of God, the very disclosure of the God of the heavens to you and me, then every single word is as equally important as another. Whether we grasp it all the same or not is secondary. It's no less significant or inspired. And we often make the joke if we hold our Bibles sideways, the, the, the white portions are, are often the ones that are maybe in the book of Numbers and Leviticus. You know, the, the, the ones we spend the least amount of time in, maybe because we find it the most difficult to grasp its significance. But you and I looked at that differently when we did our, our series on the, on the feasts of Israel and, and worked through some of that. But, but we understand that if all scripture is inspired, all is God's breath, then when Paul said it is profitable, he doesn't mean some of it's more profitable than others. It's all equally the breath of God, the word of God, the truth of God, the revelation of God. It's all equally important, equally inspired. Keep that in mind when we come to these portions of the epistles that are either introductions or conclusions. Uh, Many times uh, uh, as teaching occurs through the New Testament letters, as preaching occurs, many of those who teach and preach often omit the introductions and conclusions. And we presume we're getting to the heart of the matter. When we began this letter Two and a half years ago, we spent several weeks in the first seven verses of the first chapter, which was the introduction to the book because it contained a wealth of truth foundational for our grasping so much of what Paul was writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. We also spent in the first weeks a lot of time in what really is the longest conclusion of any of Paul's letters. We incorporated much of the truth from Romans chapter 15, uh, verses 14, right through the end of chapter 16, where a lot of important information is given to us about the background of the letter, why Paul's writing it, the fact that he hadn't been there before, had hoped to come, his aspirations, missionary plans, a lot of greetings to people. There are very important names that are referenced in that 16th chapter, people that he knew that he was sending greetings to, and people that he knew were extending their greetings to the brethren in Rome. So there were, although Paul had never literally been there with the body of believers, there were many who were known over a number of years of ministry. So all of that we covered in the early weeks of the book. What we didn't give a lot of attention to were these two closing words of of benediction. I can't think of any New Testament letter that actually has two encore performances. You go to concerts and and many times at the conclusion of the concert, the people are applauding and standing and and whatever group or individual has performed, uh, they're compelled to come back and of course they're prepared for that to do an, an encore performance. And sometimes the performance is so impacting that the group can't get away with a single encore. They have to do another encore on top of it. Maybe you've been to that occasion or or are familiar with it. And that's kind of what we've got 
in the book of Romans. Maybe a part of it is because, logically speaking, Paul wasn't there personally before, and this is the longest theological treatise on the doctrine surrounding salvation, our condition, our lostness, salvation by Jesus' substitute, uh, faith by the grace of God, the mercy of God, because of the love of God, faith alone, uh, a great treatment of our walk in Jesus, indwelt by the Spirit of God, the most detailed uh, material anywhere in the New Testament. And we have a sense in the book of Romans, as we've noted many times, this is probably what Paul systematically taught everywhere he went. As he traveled from city to city, church to church, and mentored and discipled and preached the gospel. We, we get the full breadth and panorama of what he taught in these different locations. And so having that before us, maybe that's part of the reason why the benediction is as long as it is and why you have these two interesting statements of conclusion. Chapter 15, verse 13 that we have already read, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's benediction number one within the closing context, and we're going to connect that in just a moment. What's fascinating, as we'll note, is following this initial benediction, usually benedictions, it's like, that's it, right? Done. Over. At some point in the concert, they're not coming back for another number. At some point, the lights go on, the performers disappear, and everybody's kind of like either exhausted, spent, or like, I'm not ready for this yet. And and so you have this first benediction allowing more to follow. What especially follows in verse 15 that we'll look at this morning is an admonition or a challenge and an exhortation built upon the inference of the first benediction which will take us back to through 16 chapters of truth. And we'll note that in the end of verse uh, verse, uh, verse, um, uh, 14, rather, uh, where, where Paul speaks about admonishing one another. Verse 13, a benediction. Verse 14, an admonishment or a challenge. We'll note that. And then all of the details regarding his hopes, his plans, his dreams, why he hadn't be there, been there, why he hoped he would be there, all the greetings, all the greetings extended. And then the closing verses that we, we just read that are indicative of Paul's other benedictions concerning him who was able to establish us according to his gospel. There's the final words. Where there'll be finally the curtain rising, the lights going on and coming to a conclusion. But if we begin with the assumption that all scripture is inspired by God, then this benediction has something significant for us as we, as we bid farewell in this two and a half year relationship. Well, not really, because the next four Sundays in that mini-series with Ephesians, Romans' little brother, we'll kind of have additional little encores as we bring the two letters together in, in theme. Verse 13 his initial benediction comes really at the conclusion of an important section in paragraph that we've spent three weeks working through. We entitled that last segment, Relationships with Difficult People. And it was all about 2,000 years ago, difficulties in relationships because of customs, lifestyles, practices that were in conflict back then. The two big issues were foods that were eaten and weren't eaten and, and, and days of worship and, and others had other days of worship of priority. It created conflict. A lot of it, not only Jew to Jew, Gentile to Gentile, but also between Jews and Gentiles, significant. And we spent three weeks working through that, applying the theme in our culture 2,000 years removed We have a lot of other issues that create difficulties, don't we? We noted that. And here, the section concludes, especially in Romans 15, uh, verses 7 through 13, the challenge that we have to embrace each other, accept each other, even though we have all of these differences. 
cultural differences, ideas on secondary issues that we end up making primary and divide us. Back then, the biggest of those issues that challenged us in the ability to embrace each other in verse 7, that we're called to do because Jesus embraced or accepted us with all of our warts and blemishes. Most of those came between Jews and Gentiles. And so you have in verses 9 through 12, if you notice, a whole series of Old Testament quotes. They all come at the same theme. Some from the Psalms, some from the Law of of Moses, And the theme in those quotes in verses 9 through 12 have to do with Jews and and Gentiles. I want to read those verses together with you. Just do a quick follow as I read them in verse 9. For the Gentiles uh, are glorifying God for his mercy as it's written. Therefore, I will give uh, praise to thee among the Gentiles, Jews and and non-Jews worshiping the Messiah together. Unheard of for Jews, unheard of for Gentiles, brought near in one body. This is what God would bring to pass, what he's been doing for 2,000 years, and ultimately he will do that in the days of his glorious kingdom when he comes to reign. And he will do it in all of eternity when those in the book of Revelation from every tongue, every tribe will gather and extol him. Worthy you are worthy. And so that will come to pass. Verse 10 of Romans 15 again, citing other scriptures. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. God bringing Jewish believers and Gentile believers together. And again in verse 11, praise the Lord all the Gentiles, let all the nations praise him. When we get into our series beginning this fall on the prophecies of Isaiah, we will take note of how many times Isaiah makes promises given by God to the people of Israel to that day in the future when the nations will gather together with believing Hebrews, and worship the Messiah as one. Stunning prophetic scripture. Inferred here even in in verse 10. And then again, you notice verse 12. Again, again, just to be illustrative of how many times the scriptures speak to Jews and Gentiles together in truth, in redemption, worshiping Jesus, worshiping the God of heaven. There shall come the root of Jesse, Familiar terminology we'll see in Isaiah as well. He will rise to rule over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles hope. Catch the word hope. The conclusion to this section about relationships with difficult people comes back to the big issue 2,000 years ago. The promise of what can only happen through faith in Jesus. When we talk about Ephesians, Romans' little brother, we'll see that in Ephesians chapter 2. God breaking down the middle wall of partition that separated Jews and Gentiles in the court, in the temple area. God will bring both into one new man, one body, repeated over and over again. That's what Paul's addressing in these verses in Romans chapter 15. There is that hope he will bring that to pass. Having affirmed what only the gospel can produce, what only real spiritual life in Jesus can produce, here is his initial benediction. Pick up on the word hope in verse 13. Now may the God of hope. Now we've got to pause there for a moment. Because this one attribute or character trait or one gift of entrustment that God is presenting to anyone who would turn from sin and place faith and trust in Jesus alone for forgiveness and salvation, he is introduced to us as the God of hope. Only the God of hope will be able to fill us with all joy and peace in our believing. We'll note in a minute that the word believe is in this ing sense, ongoing 
trust and faith. Only the God of hope will fill us as if overflowing with joy and peace while we are believing, ultimately that we will abound in what? There's the word hope yet a third time. By the power of God the Holy Spirit. So let's package this in the context of 16 chapters. And between now and about 10 p.m., we will <laughs> review. I already lost you. Um, so, so a quick package. The God of hope will fill us. He's really calling us back to the very beginning. Because you tell me, if the first section of the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 18 through chapter 3, verse 20, remember its theme? The righteousness of God and our utter depravity, our total lostness, our absolute sinfulness. The fact that Romans 1.18, we are subject to the wrath of God, the judgment of God because of our sin. Jews and Gentiles. His argument in that section to the Jew who believed because they were God's chosen, God's promised ones, automatically had the free pass simply because they were given the covenants and the promise and the law to presume that they were already in. Like the wink, we're in. Everything mitigates against that in that first section. For the Jew who thought because God honored them in his calling, or the Jew to whom God entrusted the revelation of God, the law of God, to presume that that was automatic passage, to presume that by obeying the law, the rituals, the liturgy, that one would work their way up and the Jews had it out front of the Gentiles they were subject to the same wrath, the same condemnation, to whom much is given, much is required, having been gifted with all that God spoke to them and still miss it is even more tragic. So they're under God's judgment and wrath. If there is no repentance and faith, but only by works and liturgy, presuming I'm there. It's a message in our own culture, 2,000 years later, to a whole culture of broad Christendom, self-identifying as I'm a Christian. Have no clue what that means in our culture anymore because it's become so broad, so encompassing, so embracing, it's virtually empty in words by itself. I can't imagine, only the Father knows, how many self-profess as Christians simply because they were born in a home by a denominational name. Or, or born in a, in a heritage where, where mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or aunt and uncle brought me to church. Well, that's wonderful. If having been there, the truth of the gospel is brought to our hearts and minds, God illuminates, God brings light, and there is repentance and faith in Jesus. But just going to church or being part of a heritage that is identified as Christian in one sense or another means zero. Zero. In fact, it may be an ultimate indictment against us to have some element of truth there in our midst, but not repent and be responsive to it. So for the Jews, there is the indictment. For the Gentiles, who might say, well, the law was given to them, not to us, but remember chapter 2, God wrote that law, the moral principles of that law in your heart. You're accountable just as well. And you remember that, 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 um, that bullet section in chapter 3, verses 9 and following, those seven Old Testament quotes, there's none righteous. None. Not even one. None. We're all in that condition. Listen, there is no religious system anywhere on the face of the earth from the beginning of time right through the end of time including today, not one religious system that begins with that theological premise. Not one. That's shocking. Every religious system presumes that we're, 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 we're marred, we're scarred, 
we're blunted, we're weakened, we have issues, but we can self-redeem. We can get better. I've said it a thousand times if I've said it once, right? You can fix sick, but you can't fix dead. Ephesians 2 verse 1, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. That one statement, we'll probably come to it when we do the, co- the, the comparison beginning next week. That one statement is Romans 1.18 to chapter 3 verse 20. If we would begin embracing that theological premise and truth as absolute, and it disturbs me enormously that so much of what I hear preached today washes that down, that, it, it utterly frightens me. 45 years coming from my Judaism, man, that's one of the, one of the great truths of Scripture that grabbed hold of me from its very beginning. That even my family, my ancestors, try as they might to obey the law, to follow the commandments as the rabbis dictated. Attempting to produce that, believing I can present myself before God by my own efforts, my own works, my own good doing, my own religiosity, my own rituals, my own liturgy. I can, I can do it. I can climb the ladder. I can get there. God will embrace me. I hope maybe to come to the reality of truth that that is absolutely impossible. We, we need to hear with discernment so much surrounding us of, of the preaching of self-attainment, of self-possibility, of self-improvement, of self-betterment. You see, if, if there is a possibility that we could get there ourselves... You don't need the God of hope. You don't need that engiftment from the throne to broken lost people in verse 13 of chapter 15. You and I don't need the God of hope. Because we can be providers of our own hope, of our own path, of our own road, of our own way. The reason why he's the God of hope, and we know biblically that word links itself not to something that is wish, want, maybe, uncertain. But a biblical hope is firm and fixed and absolute. Because it's built upon who Jesus is and what he's done for me. Remember the the occasions where we find that word. We could cite so many, but we'll only do a couple. Remember remember chapter chapter 5 and verse 2? Go back real quick. Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Paul begins to make a, 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 just a start-up list of these treasures, these blessings from heaven to those who come by faith to believe in Jesus. Those who turn from their sin and say, Yes, Jesus, I, I believe you are the Lamb of God. I, I believe you are the precious Redeemer. I believe you're the one alone who paid the price of the judgment that I deserve. I believe that I deserve the wrath of God from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, Romans 1.18. I deserve that, but you became the, the lamb, the Passover lamb, the substitute sacrifice. You suffered all of that instead of, in place of me. And so here are these extraordinary blessings. Remember Romans 5, 1, Therefore, having been justified, declared righteous. Not by my own doing, not by my own accomplishments, not by my own religion, not by my own striving, not by my own climbing of stairs to earn my way to God. We have been justified by faith in Jesus. We have peace with God. We'll get to that in a moment. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. But, but verse 2, we have this introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the what? Hope of what? The glory of God. There is the absolute certainty and expectation that because God has produced spiritual life in me, that I will one day see him face to face. In the words of John, I will see him and I will be like him. 
and, and, and the words of Scripture, I will be presented before his throne faultless and, and without blame. I have the expectation that I will see him face to face. Paul said it in, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. He is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Same truth. When he's in me and all my sins been purged and the glory of God in the person of Jesus and the spirit of God is living inside of me, I'm a temple of the dwelling place of God. He is the hope that I have, the certain expectation, the absolute persuasion that I will be with him forever. The apostle Peter in chapter 1 and and verse 3, we, we, have, we have redemption in Jesus and we have that same hope, that, the hope of the, of the glory of God. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, the apostle Paul speaks about the coming of the, the blessed hope and appearing of Jesus. And so, especially, not exclusively, when the Bible uses this kind of terminology about the God of hope, it's especially speaking to the expectation we have, one day we will be with him forever. Now now that's ours. Go back to Romans 15, middle of verse 13. In our believing, I-N-G. That is, we we are repeatedly present tense, in that state of assurance and confidence in who Jesus is and what he did for us. And as we are always believing that, our hope and expectation of being with him forever is affirmed experientially, pragmatically, practically. It's there. But you and I also know all too well that we are human. Hmm? And there are times when our believing ing it wavers a little bit hmm? aren't there times when when what kind of because of our walk or maybe because of our life circumstances we kind of feel like we're we're not exactly on solid ground and and we think god why god what kind of losing it kind of in a fog kind of not not seeing it part of that journey it, it's probably why that that challenge takes on a little bit different light in the 12th chapter of Romans. Quickly turn back there. Romans chapter, chapter 12. And, and remember verse 12? Part of this one anothering opportunity we have, believers to believers, because we're in Christ and we're in the family of God. And, and back then, many believers in Jesus were facing all kinds of hardship and persecution, and opposition, and some were losing hope. You ever been there? I have. Not, not ashamed to admit it, because I'm human like you are. There are times when I feel like there are cracks, where, where instead of sitting on a solid rock, I feel like I'm in quicksand, and I'm sinking quick and deep. Hmm? Been there? And Lord, knowing that part of, part of the entrustment and privilege of ministry we have toward each other is in coming alongside of those brothers and sisters in Jesus who are at that place when we're a little sturdy in our believing and to, to lift them out of the, the quicksand, if you will, because the, the odds are somewhere down the road the circumstances might shift and we might be in the quicksand and they may be in the rock and they have to lift us up. So you have Romans 12 and verse 12. You notice the, ver- the word hope there? We are rejoicing, there's the I-N-G, celebrating, rejoicing in our hope. It's kind of a collective thing. The body of believers are together and we're worshiping, rejoicing with great joy in the hope we have in Jesus as we sang about it this morning in Jesus our Redeemer. And what he's done for us, what a celebration of praise. Rejoicing in hope so that those who are maybe waffling can refocus on the God of hope. So you come back to Romans chapter 15 
and verse 13. And this benediction calls us to a reconnection with the God alone who brings us certainty and hope. That there is a path and a person who overcomes all of our wretchedness, all of our fallenness, all of our sinfulness, all of our weakness, all of our frailties. Even when life's suffering, like do you remember Romans chapter 8, verse 18? Hmm? Remember these, these words? I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Man, there were some who weren't seeing through the clouds. There were some who weren't seeing a lot of hope. There were some who were feeling overwhelmed. Some families who were being, who were being uh, persecuted or, or losing their lives. Uh, some whose homes are being burnt to the ground. Some are being thrown into prison. Some who are being ostracized from their communities. And, and man, they're, they're, they're feeling whew, no hope. But, but the God of hope is the one who's the deliverer. So his prayer in chapter 15, verse 13, builds on the premise of the one alone who brings us hope, both in this life, in all of its stuff, as well as hope for forgiveness of sin for the future. So I want to ask you, because Paul's assuming as we come to the end of this book, that the truth of our lostness and all that Jesus alone did in becoming our substitute, suffering the wrath of God in our stead, presuming that we've placed our faith and trust alone in him. Man, do you remember, you remember these words in chapter 3 and verse 22? The righteousness of God that's revealed comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believed. No distinction, Jews or Gentiles. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's our condition. The heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Ezekiel, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, the deliverance from bondage, which is in Christ Jesus. The one that God publicly displayed as the perfect sacrifice through the shedding of his blood through faith. That God of hope. The assumption is that this is your God, is he? Do you have that hope that that Jesus paid that price for your sin to deliver you from the wrath of God, to replace it with, by the grace of God, the mercy of God, the unconditional love of God, the forgiveness of God, the hope of eternal life, his powerful presence, chapter 6, 7, and 8, a new nature implanted in me. Jesus Christ in me, God the Holy Spirit indwelling me. I'm a temple of the Spirit of God in chapter 8. Do you have that confidence? Because Paul's saying by the end of this, every believer in Jesus embracing this truth should be at a place of saying, yes, I believe all of this about Jesus. He alone gives me hope. So Paul's benediction prayer is that that God of hope would fill us. There's not, not a whole lot of room for empty space when he's filling us. It's, it's when we get in the way, when we get in the way that, you know, less full, or we're sensing less full, but he's always fully there. Our difficulty is, is believing the fullness of his presence. The God of hope fill you with all joy, the joy of knowing in spite of our circumstances who he is and what he's done. The peace of God that passes all understanding in our believing. So that our hope is overflowing because God the Holy Spirit, verse 13, is indwelling us. That's a pretty cool benediction. Because it encompasses 16 chapters just in one thought. But I noted when we began this that that with this encore number one, there follows another admonition. It's like, again, again. 
I mean, haven't you, haven't you nailed me enough? 16 chapters, I keep feeling that piercing, that conviction, that challenge. And follow this, because this is a powerful conclusion. Verse 14. Concerning you, the you references all of those who are believing, all of those who are clinging to the God of hope, all of those knowing confidence and assurance of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. We're, we're knowing that joy. We're knowing that peace. No matter the circumstances, we're overflowing in hope. Concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced. Greek word meaning fully persuaded. Gee, you're pretty confident, Paul. I am absolutely confident and persuaded that, notice the double pronoun, you yourselves again reinforcing who he's talking to, are full of goodness. Now be careful. This isn't goodness as if the generic goodness of humanity. This is the goodness of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. This is the goodness comes by the righteousness of God implanted in us. This is the nature of Jesus being lived out in us. This is God the Holy Spirit reflecting his presence and fruit in us. It's that goodness that's produced by the heart of God, the nature of God transforming the child of God. It's not our inherent goodness. There is no inherent goodness. That, That transformation in us, Paul is fully persuaded that we are then filled with all knowledge, Filled in the passive sense, being acted upon. God is the one who has filled us with himself. And filled us with the discernment of truth. Not just academically, but experientially. We're we're believing this about who Jesus is and what he's done. And possessing all of that. The closing words of verse 14. Become a kick in the proverbial rear. I am absolutely persuaded, he said, given that that's who you are, that you are now enabled, equipped, called and empowered by God himself to admonish one another. I would submit to you that by intention, this is his closing zinger. Here's Paul saying, listen, here is the truth of God, the revelation of God, that the end of the letter describes, as we read in that final benediction, this mystery that was veiled in the old covenant, but now made new in the new covenant, of Jesus who he is as Messiah, Savior, final sacrifice, Fulfilling the law, fulfilling the Passover, fulfilling all of those temporal sacrifices, all of that truth, that that mystery that was veiled. Jews and Gentiles believing in him, one body in Christ, didn't know it back then, kind of in the clouds. Now it's clear. Paul's saying, listen, this has been now entrusted to you. You have a task. If you believe the truth of Scripture about the condition of the human race and you believe the truth of Scripture about Jesus and what he accomplished for your sin, and if you believe that if someone turns from their sin and embraces Jesus, that they will be forgiven of all the sin, that Jesus will indwell them, that he will implant a new nature in them, old nature unplugged, new nature planted in, God the Holy Spirit dwelling, Jesus indwelling within us, equipping us to be Uh, new natures to to be walking in newness of life, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. If you believe that truth, if you believe that we are called relationally to transformational living, if you believe that God calls us to respond as a living sacrifice, as a burnt offering, give all of myself to him, if you believe that relationships between believers are now forever changed because of that, relationships with unbelievers hostile toward us are forever changed because of that, relationships to our culture and state and government are forever changed by that, relationships with difficult people are forever changed by that, if you believe that and are allowing God to equip you to live that out, then... Admonish one another. Now the word admonish comes from the Greek word nuthito, nuthito, meaning 
That's actually a word that's been used by the developing school of biblical counseling. It's, it's, it's a term that speaks of coming lovingly, sensitively, with compassion, alongside of one another and brothers and sisters in Jesus, and to be lovingly in their face. Because their walk with Jesus matters just as much as mine. And in this culture that soft pedals, that strokes, that pets, I'm okay, you're okay, you know, just follow the ten rules to a happy life. The path that God's ordained frequently for the Spirit of God to bring conviction and transformation to one another comes from one another. We are called not just to stroke each other or not just to make believe that it's okay or not just to say, I'll pray for you. And then maybe we don't. Or not just to talk about it with other people. Did you know? But the challenge is to confront. Admonish nuthetel mean I'm going to confront but I'm not going to do it with the arrogance of the Pharisees. In the book of Galatians, there is the reminder in the sixth chapter of the spirit of confronting and challenging believers. The opening words of Galatians 6, if, if someone's caught, discovered in sin and a trespass, you are spiritual. And again, that's not a, that's not a statement describing the character of someone's spiritual life. It's, it's just a general characterization of the fact that here is someone who's also filled with the Spirit of God, indwelt by the Spirit of God, who has the authority of the Word of God, the principles of God, to challenge the life of believers who are walking out of step. So it doesn't mean you have to rise to a certain level of maturity to be at this place. Restore such a one. Restore a Greek word meaning a doctoral care, fixing broken bones. If you've been dislocated, you want to make sure somebody's going to set that bone back in socket who knows what they're doing. Because it's already going to hurt. But, but we don't want to compound matters. Restore such a one how? In a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and we're fulfilling the ultimate law of Christ that we love one another as Christ loved us. But we are challenged to confront, to admonish, to come alongside, to say, my brother, my sister, man, I love you in Jesus. And I would hope you would do this to me if I'm in a similar place, even with other issues, because you love me and care about me. And I'm here to challenge you. You can't, you can't press on in that, in that place. There's got to be, by the grace of God, we know the same Jesus. We want to we wanna honor the same Jesus. We want to we wanna walk with the same Jesus. And I'll, and I'll journey with you. I'll stand with you. I don't care what the fight is or what the struggle is. I'm here. I'm not a finger pointer. I'm a joiner with you. Let's deal with this together. Let's pray through this together. I'll help you. We'll walk through this together. But by the grace of God, we're going we're gonna to journey as victors, not, not as victims. And, and we're going to be overcomers because Jesus was an overcomer. That's what we are called to be. So in the simplest of terms, what Paul is saying to you and me is, here's the whole package of truth. You just don't own it for yourself. You now own it for your brother and sister. Would you rather this one not be here? (laughs) You want want to take out an eraser? (laughs) If it doesn't apply to me, it doesn't apply to you. But if it applies to me, it applies to you. So we have to ponder how we process these 16 chapters. Because the word ends, to him who is able to establish us according to the truth of the gospel and the preaching of Jesus. And then the last phrase of verse 27, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever and ever. Amen. God gains the glory 
when redeemed believers in Jesus journey alongside of each other and exhort each other in our redemptive walk. Are you in that place of believing? Are you holding on to the God of all hope? The God of all grace? Aren't you thankful we have that Jesus? Let's pray together. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. We need you. You are the source of our hope. There is no hope apart from you. We come to the elements of the Passover and are reminded of why our hope is firm. Our confidence is rich and assured and our expectation is as secure as you are. And so we ask, Lord God, that you would increase our hope, increase our believing, and use us to exhort one another in the pursuit of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.